Interpreting the success of a treatment approach. How do you know if it works and how well it works? I know you're literate, but are you numerate? Numeracy is similar to literacy, but instead of interpreting the meaning of words, you interpret the meaning of numbers. Note that this doesn't equate to doing the math, the statistics, but that clinical application of the end result of the calculations is achievable and hopefully communicable. What do numbers mean? Well, that depends on the interpreter. Of course, it's human nature to convey our own bias and certainly to use numbers in the most convincing light for what we do. Well, there's the study and the researchers who conduct the study, your patient, and then the middleman, you. Well, like it or not, you become the official translator of statistics. You need to be bilingual. Know the results for a group of patients, the study, and attempt to translate into results for your patient. And you need to convey why and also include reasonable options for the patient. I think you must admit that second on your list for reasons not to read an article, your first being time, is that when you encounter the numbers, you just want to gloss over them and get to the conclusion, hoping the researchers and editors of the periodical have done their job and give you the bottom line. But you're rarely comfortable that you truly understand the meaning and relevance of the statistical terminology and numbers. Let's change that. If you don't see at least one of these descriptors or their acronyms in the abstract to an article on an intervention or risk factor, you'll have your first warning sign about the scientific validity of that study. This is our vocabulary list, the words you need to interpret for your own understanding. Absolute risk, relative risk, numbers needed to treat, odds ratios, effect sizes, mean differences. Sounds daunting. Don't worry, I'm here to help and I promise the math involves either simple division or subtraction and frankly, this is all now automated through online calculators. Also know that they are for the most part mathematically related. But even before the math, you'll be able to understand the meaning and usefulness of these words. Here lies the secret of what we're about to do. By using examples and talking about results first, we will effortlessly learn the language used to express the results utilized in study papers. You'll be able to at least generally determine what a study is saying, despite the confusing terminology, and determine whether it's worth reading, what's important and valid information, and whether it's usable. Understand the patient's dilemma. They want to be in more control of their health management choices, but most are not trained enough in the language of statistics to make sense of that information if it's offered in terms such as p-values, confidence intervals, etc. They're not numerate. We need to assist the patient in making decisions regarding their health. Although we are always sensitive to the patient being involved in their health management choices, we understand that they are relying on us to give the information in a manner that's usable. In other words, how we explain the benefits and risks of a given treatment to a colleague is certainly in need of edit and translation before explaining the same information to a patient. Where does the question come from? It might be a question based on lack of experience, but it just as often may reflect curiosity, an attempt to learn something new or specific about something you already know. Well, the question can also come from your patient it probably will center around whether they will improve or if there is a risk to treatment. So what's the patient going to ask? Well, what are the chances that I will get better with this treatment and how long will it take? What are the chances of responding to a standard treatment such as medication or surgery or no treatment? Of course, they won't ask it just one way. What if they read in the newspaper or heard on TV about a miracle cure for fill-in-the-blank? Well, here's an example. New drug reduces cancer death by 33%. They may ask, what do you know about this? Well, let's admit it. Due to the internet, our patients are coming in preloaded with more questions based on their knowledge, opinion, and some prejudice toward what they, quote, understand about their problem. We have to sort out any misconceptions if possible. So what do we want to know in order to answer their question? 33% reduction of cancer. Compared to what? No treatment? In other words, 33% of these cancer patients will survive and 66% will not if they don't have this new treatment, or does it mean compared to another existing treatment? I'll explain that in a moment. Also, what if you find out that the newer treatment is far more expensive with more side effects? I'm going to focus on death so I can get your attention. Let's say you were an oncologist who had to explain that same study to a patient. Here's one way it could be expressed. 
you have one-third less the risk of death with the newer treatment compared to the standard treatment, or the risk of death is about two-thirds that of those in the standard treatment group. The combination makes more sense. Your risk of death is reduced one-third with the newer treatment compared to standard treatment so that you now have only two-thirds the risk of someone using the standard treatment. The first statement is called relative risk reduction. The next statement about having two-thirds the risk of someone on standard treatment is called relative risk or the risk ratio, and it's just that, calculated by dividing the rates of death with the new treatment by those of the standard treatment. So now we know they were speaking in terms of comparison to another treatment, not a comparison to no treatment. Well, sounds good. What's missing? If the actual death rate for those on the standard treatment was only 5.7%, and the death rate in the new treatment group was only 3.8%, then we know that the death rate using standard care for this cancer is not very high to begin with. The ratio between treatment groups magnified the effect of the new treatment to 66%, which is a true comparison as a ratio, when the actual difference between the rates is only 1.9%. That's 5.7 minus 3.8. Because I said cancer, the assumption was that the death rate was 100%, so that the reduction of even one-third compared to standard care seemed impressive, but we didn't know the actual rates and the fact that the standard treatment seems quite effective. Now let's read the headline. New drug reduces cancer death by 1.9%. Hmm, not quite a headline anymore. Let's do it again to emphasize the learning points. If the risk of death is 10% in the standard group compared to 6% in the new treatment group, the difference is 4%, but that's a 40% reduction in risk, and it's also a 60% relative risk, also called the risk ratio. Now, altogether, the 4% is called the absolute risk reduction, the 40% reduction in risk is the relative risk reduction, and the 60% is the relative risk, also called the risk ratio. Now you understand the confusion. Any of these could be used as a percentage only, but unless you know which of the three statistics it represents, you could be overly enthusiastic about the results. Let's do it again, but the risk of death is 1% in the standard treatment group, and it's 0.6% in the new treatment group. That's still a 40% reduction, but only equals an advantage of helping 0.4% more people treated compared to the standard treatment group. The 0.4% represents the absolute risk reduction. The difference, as we can see graphically, is the size of the group. So what makes the difference? What changes the meaning is the actual outcome rate in the treatment group and the comparison group, in this case, death. This is called the absolute risk reduction or risk difference. The risk ratio and relative risk reduction calculations are blind to the actual numbers because they are only ratios between numbers. 10 is 10% of 100, but also 1 is 10% of 10, and 0.1 is 10% of 1. The ratio remains the same, but clearly the numbers are magnitudes of difference lost when calculated as ratios. The actual differences in rates between groups is, again, called the absolute risk reduction or risk difference. Well, this is the problem with relative risk and relative risk reduction, which gives a magnification of effect, often used by researchers attempting to sway the reader into thinking the effect of a newer treatment is greater than it really is, or in reality its value would be determined in the real world. So you have just painlessly learned your first big lesson in how to read and interpret the literature because most articles will report results using one of the stats we just covered, relative risk or relative risk reduction. They will rarely use the risk difference, also called the absolute risk reduction, especially when the rates of the outcome in the study are low, as we saw in the previous examples. The good news is you can calculate the absolute difference on your own by simply subtracting the new treatment outcome rate from the standard treatment outcome rate. 
know that obviously it does not need to be death we're talking about. Let's say it's a compression fracture rate or fall rates or cruciate injury rates, and the treatment approach is not necessarily medication, but could be manipulation, exercise, or vitamin D supplementation. Let's continue, but first we want to review the absolute risk a bit more. As we said, it's the difference between the control event rate and the treatment event rate. Notice these are also called group occurrence instead of event rate in some studies. We will use the TER and CER. Translated, the condition or outcome you're examining occurs at a certain rate in the standard treatment group versus the new treatment group. The absolute risk is the difference between those rates. Remember the aliases. It's also called risk difference or absolute risk reduction. Let's use another medication example. A fairly recent research study compared the reduction of ischemic events in patients using a new approach, clopidogrel, the product name is Plavix, versus the standard tried-and-true antiplatelet aspirin. It was indicated in the study that the improvement using Plavix versus aspirin was 8.7%, a small number but possibly significant given the seriousness of the outcome ischemic events, which included myocardial infarction, stroke, or other vascular death. Well, let's use our new knowledge to look under the hood a little. It turns out the ischemic event rate in the aspirin treatment group was only 5.83%, and in the Plavix group it was 5.32%. That does work out to an 8.7% advantage for Plavix if calculated as a relative risk reduction, which is 1 minus the risk ratio. But now subtract the event rates in both groups. You get 0.51%. Now we get to add one of the most important concepts for clinicians and patients, the number needed to treat. Talk about easy math. This is simply the inverse of the absolute risk difference we just calculated. Remember, this was 0.51% or 0.0051 when not a percent. So simply divide 0.0051 into 1 and you get 196. What does that number mean? It means you would need to treat 196 patients with Plavix to avoid one adverse event compared to aspirin. Well, considering the cost of this new drug versus aspirin, do you think this is the logical choice to switch to this new treatment? Well, here's a recent study that appeared in many newspapers. Crestor, one of the statin drugs used to treat hyperlipidemia, was touted as being able to reduce MI by 55%, stroke by 48%, and angioplasty by 45%. Let's look again at some specifics based on what we've learned, in particular the absolute risk reduction and the number needed to treat. Understand that Crestor is a major moneymaker with annual sales of $4.5 billion dollars. This was a study used to decide whether to extend the approved use for those prescribed Crestor by including the following. If patients were male and over 50, or female and over 60, and if he had one major risk factor such as smoking or hypertension and an elevated C-reactive protein, or CRP. Interestingly, the author and primary investigator was the developer of the CRP test. Before we get to the numbers, know that this was a comparison to no drug. Now the numbers. For the placebo group, major ischemic events occurred only 0.37% of the time. In the Crestor treated group, the event rate was 0.17%. The relative risk or risk ratio, divide 0.17 by 0.37, is 54%. Subtract from 1 to get the relative risk reduction of 56%. Well, now you know where they got the headline percentages. Subtract the two event rates, and you get the absolute risk reduction of 0.2%. The inverse of this is the number needed to treat, 1 divided by 0.2, and you get 500. 
An NNT of 500 means you would need to treat 500 people compared to no treatment to avoid one myocardial infarction. Oh, by the way, that would cost over $600,000 per year to avoid one event, and that is only the cost for 500 patients taking this drug. Now, how confident can we be in the research study that uses a sample population that it's statistically sound enough to apply to a larger similar group of patients not in the study? Well, there are two methods. One used is called a p-value. Basically, it's the representation that the vast majority of difference between groups is not due to chance. The most commonly used is 0.05 which would mean that there's only a 5% probability that the difference was due to chance. But as we've seen before, there are ranges of results in a study. This range of results within a study can be demonstrated using a similar approach, which is called a confidence interval. If that is 95%, it essentially means that the true value is likely to be in the stated confidence interval range 95% of the time. It is affected by the occurrence of the outcome of interest, which most of the time means that the more patients, the narrower the CI range. It means it's more precise. When considering a study or treatment, it should have certain properties, including being a prospective study, hopefully a randomized study, where the patients and treating doctors are blind to which treatment the patient receives. Of course, with manipulation, this is impossible. So at the very least, the individuals collecting data should be blinded. Also, there should be a large enough sample of patients. There are statistical approaches to this, but in general, you should see no less than 50 in each treatment and control group. It would be best to compare to a no-treatment group to determine how much natural history contributes to improvement. What about the term effect size? The effect size measured as relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, etc., is only used when there is a dichotomous factor that is either present or not. The disease is present or not, the risk factor is present or not, the patient improved or did not improve. What do you do if the thing you're looking at is continuous, such as blood pressure, temperature, or stages or categories of disease, or an outcome measure like a questionnaire? You look at the difference between or among means, the mean difference or weighted mean difference. There are actually standardized effect sizes that are used when comparing the magnitude of impact across different outcome measures within a study or across numerous studies in a systematic review. This can be demonstrated graphically as a forest plot where the range of mean differences expressed as confidence intervals is constructed as a horizontal line that allows and shows the ends of the range. If the range line extends across the midline, which represents zero and no difference, then the results are in question. Here's an example. Let's now look at how studies using outcomes questionnaires present their findings. Here's an example of a study on the management of acute low back pain on two different groups using usual medical care and guideline-based care delivered by chiropractors that included manipulation. The primary outcome measure was the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire. You can see that improvement is measured as a decrease in the scores. For the usual care group, there was little improvement at 16 weeks. However, there was an almost three-point decrease in Roland Moore scores for the guideline-based chiropractic manipulation group. We can see that the mean difference is 2.52, and its corresponding 95% confidence interval is 0.88 to 4.16 in favor of the patients managed with guideline-based recommendations. You can also see the p-value is 0.003, well under the study's stated p-value of 0.05. So, we know the mean differences are statistically significant. How do we know they are clinically significant? For each outcome measure, there are usually standardized changes in scores that represent what is called the Minimal Clinically Important Difference, or MCID. Here we can see in this table of outcome measures, minimal clinically important differences for several questionnaires. 
For the Roland Morris, we can see that the range is 2 to 5, which our study has demonstrated, so we can conclude that it is at least a minimal clinically important difference. So now we have several ways of looking at effectiveness, including the number needed to treat, the effect size, and the minimal clinically important difference. Can we expedite our knowledge by taking advantages of others' expertise and summary about our item of interest? Well, yes, we can, through the systematic review. Experts in a given area review all of the available literature on a topic and, using rigid protocols for rating, sort out the higher quality studies, pull their evidence together, and come up with summary conclusions. If the patient population's outcome measures and statistical methods used in these studies is the same, a statistical pooling can be performed called a meta-analysis. Well, because many of the systematic reviews use a graphical representation, let's cover one main point about odds ratios used in these graphical representations. We have discussed risk ratios, but not odds ratios. Generally, odds ratios are used in case control studies, retrospective studies, that look back over time to determine associated risk. However, they can also be used in prospective studies that follow patients forward in time. They are the odds of having a disorder or an outcome in the new treatment group divided by the odds of having that same problem in the control group. If there's no difference between the odds in each group, it is mathematically equal to 1. But when a treatment prevents an adverse outcome or decreases risk, the odds ratio is, is less than 1. Let's say that the odds of a headache was 0.5 in the new treatment group, but was 2 in the comparative standard treatment group. Dividing 2 into 0.5 gives you 0.25, which is clearly below 1 and indicates an important improvement for the new treatment because of how much it reduces the odds of headache compared to the standard treatment. In addition to written summaries, these systematic reviews often use a graphical representation called a forest plot. The economy of this approach is that it gives you a comparison among studies, but most importantly, using confidence intervals demonstrates the range of results within a given study. This can also be done in a single study. The horizontal line representing the confidence interval should not cross the midline. For odds ratios, as in this case, that line is 1. As you can see, for decreasing the odds which favors the new treatment, both the circle indicating the point, estimate, or average, and the full extent of the line should not cross the midline of 1, and in fact, should be to the left of it. As you can see, each study seems to represent very different results, with some having very wide confidence intervals and some narrow. Well, remember, the wider confidence intervals usually represent a study with a small number of subjects, and vice versa for the narrower ones. So let's start summarizing. When you look at a study, the first question must be, are the patients in each group similar enough that differences more than likely will be a reflection of the intervention and not a difference from the beginning, such as patients in one group having more severe pain or being older? Only then can you move forward to determine if differences are statistically significant. This means it meets or beats the p-value set for the study, often set at a p-value of 0.05. Next, even though it may be statistically significant, is it clinically significant? For example, it may be statistically significant that treatment reduces patients' pain by one point on a 10-point scale, but is that clinically important? For this, we need to know the size of the effect, which we can access by looking at several statistics, including the absolute risk reduction, the inverse, the number needed to treat, and for studies using outcome measures, the minimal clinically important difference. Next, does it fit my practice setting? And most importantly, does the patient match the characteristics of the subjects in the study? I suggest approaching the literature like a wine connoisseur. Look at articles that are highly respected, peer-reviewed journals, those that have the respect of other connoisseurs, you know, the academic eggheads, the researchers, and the up-to-date clinicians. Next, if it is a subject of interest and relevance to you, check the abstract to see if one of the statistical approaches used to report results is present and how it's stated. Sniff to see if there are any problems, such as too small an N or number of subjects in the study. Always look for about 50 subjects in each group. Read the conclusions and see if it smells and tastes right when compared to the reported results. 
If this all seems to taste good, sample some more by reading the discussion section of the article. If they do not identify weaknesses to their study, it's likely a sign not to continue. Finally, if the study appears to be well done and is communicated using the appropriate statistics, integrate it into your knowledge and hopefully apply when appropriate to what you do. Test it on your patients, especially if they match the characteristics of the study population, and do your own comparison in your clinical research lab, your practice.